in his classic 2022 video on the five kinds of paradox, YouTuber Jan Meesley describes one type of paradox as one guy getting very confused, writing it down, and getting it published. These are the sorts of paradoxes someone might set up with the phrase, but when you really think about it, when in fact they should be saying, when you really don't think about it at all. The first example Jan Meesley gives of this type of paradox is the white horses aren't horses paradox. What, you might say? How could this possibly be? Well, when you really think about it, white horses refers to all horses which are colored white. However, horses refers to a much broader class, namely any horse whatsoever, without regard to color. Since they refer to different categories, when you really think about it, white horses aren't horses. Of course, the problem here is that this sentence is not communicating what was demonstrated. What was demonstrated is a trivial fact that white horses and horses are terms which refer to distinct sets of horses. But this sentence as written is not clearly about the terms, it looks like it's about the horses. And so it's a horrible phrasing that you would only use if you really didn't think about it, and would only seem like a paradox if you got very confused. In 1607, Antoine Gombard was born in Poitou, France. He grew up to be a gambler, a writer, and a thinker, a regular at French salon gatherings who adopted the title Chevalier de Mirae, and one day Chevalier de Mirae's consistent losses in gambling had left him as a guy who was getting very confused. And if you look up this confused man's self-given title, you'll often find this picture as well as this one. Unfortunately though, neither of these are pictures of de Mirae. This is Fermat, and this is Blaise Pascal, both Frenchmen of the time, so perhaps de Mirae looked something like them. But unfortunately, we cannot know. Now, the confusion this man of unknown appearance had concerned two dice games. He wrote up his confusion about these two games, one of which he was winning bets on, and one of which he was consistently losing. He would then pose this problem to his friend, who was, in fact, Blaise Pascal. Pascal would later receive a more difficult problem from Demire, which would serve as a subject of a famous correspondence between Pascal and Pierre de Fermat, but that's a story for another time. As for the dice games, the first one went like this. A fair die is rolled four times, and the player wins if at least one six comes up in those four rolls. They play this game with even odds, meaning their winnings will equal the amount they wager. So if Demire bet one franc and won the game, he'd get his franc back plus an extra one for his wager. And Demire was happy to play this game an awful lot, because the way he saw it, one die had a 1 in 6 chance of coming up 6. So then he figured if the die is rolled 4 times, then there is a 4 out of 6 chance that at least 1 6 will come up in those 4 rolls. Thus, he concluded his likelihood of winning was 4 out of 6, or 2 thirds. The odds are in his favor, and his personal experience bore this out. Playing this game repeatedly, he was able to make a considerable sum. His trouble came from a second game, in which he figured his likelihood of winning should be the same. But in reality, he was consistently losing money playing this game. In the second game, he bet again with even odds, to roll at least one pair of sixes in 24 rolls of a pair of dice. He reasoned that there are 36 different ways that a pair of dice can come up, and only one of those ways is a pair of sixes, so his chances of winning on a single throw are 1 in 36. Since there's a 1 in 36 chance of rolling sixes in a single roll of a pair of dice, Demire figured that in 24 rolls there would be a 24 out of 36 chance, 
of rolling at least one pair of sixes. Of course, if you reduce this fraction by a factor of 12, it again comes up to two thirds. So again, he thought not only were the odds in his favor when playing this game, but they in fact should be exactly the same as the prior game. But he found himself winning this one and consistently losing this one. So imagine you're Blaise Pascal, a brilliant mathematician who was a child prodigy, and you receive a letter from your friend Chevalier de Mire detailing this conundrum. Where has he gone wrong in his logic? To many of you, the mistake may seem obvious. It's a clear case of one guy getting confused and writing it down, and now it's falsely called a paradox. But you have to understand the context. This is in the early 1600s. The theory of probability was hardly in its infancy, so Demire was grappling with things that were scarcely understood. If you haven't already identified Demire's errors, now's your chance to pause the video and take a closer look. Otherwise, let's go ahead and see where he went wrong. <sighs> Sure enough, both of Demire's calculations were incorrect. And this is easy to realize if you attempt to extend his methods of reasoning. He figured that the one in six chance of rolling a six on a single die implied that in four rolls, there would be a four out of six chance to roll at least one six. But then of course, it would follow that in six rolls of a die, there is a six out of six or 100% chance guaranteed that you're going to roll at least one six. And this is an absurdity, since it's certainly possible for a die to be rolled six times without a single six coming up. Despite his errors, he felt like his reasoning was correct because it is the case that this game favors the player. And calculating the actual probability of winning this game is pretty straightforward. The primary difficulty, if you're a beginner in probability theory, is that in the game there are four rolls. And so to achieve the winning condition of rolling at least one six, well, that can happen many different ways. For example, any one of the four rolls rolls could contain the winning six. It could occur on the very first roll, or it could occur on the third roll, or maybe it occurs on the fourth roll. There are multiple possibilities of rolling that winning six. Of course, complicating things further, it's possible that there are multiple sixes among the four rolls. So the question is, how do we calculate the probability while accurately taking into account all the different ways that someone could win? This turns out to be a common situation in probability theory where looking at the likelihood of the opposite of the event we're interested in is actually easier. It might be kind of complicated to calculate the probability that in four rolls, there's at least one six. But what if we look at the probability of losing, the probability that in all four rolls, not a single six shows up? This is more straightforward because in this calculation, every roll is free to be whatever it likes except for six. Of course, each individual roll has a five out of six chance of not being a six. Furthermore, the different throws of a die are what we call independent, meaning the results of one throw do not affect the likelihood for what will come up next. Since each roll has a five out of six chance of not being a six, and none of the rolls affect each other, to find the probability that none of them are six, we can just multiply five six by itself repeatedly for those four rolls. So raise it to the power of four. This turns out to be about 0.4. Eight. And here's where we use what's called the law of complement. A player is either going to win or lose this game. We now know their probability of losing turns out to be 0.48. The complement or opposite of losing is winning. Hence, the probability of winning must be one minus the probability of its opposite losing. So we subtract 0.48 and find that the probability of winning is 0.52. And this works, of course, because together winning and losing must make up all possible probability for this game. Those are the only two possibilities. Either we win 
or we lose, so together they add to 1. Hence, if we know the probability of losing, we can find the probability of winning. So the actual probability of winning is 0.52, or 52%, a good deal less than the percentage that Demire had calculated of two-thirds, or about 66%. However, critically, they are both greater than half, so he was correct that his odds are good for winning this game. Of course, in the second game, Demire makes the exact same error, thinking that just because we're rolling the pair of dice 24 times, we can multiply the 1 over 36 chance of rolling sixes by 24 to get a two-thirds chance of rolling at least one pair of sixes in 24 rolls. Again, this would imply that we're guaranteed a pair of sixes in 36 rolls, which of course isn't true. The actual probability of winning this game can be found in very much the same way as the previous game. We know that when a pair of dice is rolled, there are 36 possibilities, since there are 6 possibilities for each die. Now, 35 of those 36 possibilities would not be favorable for the player. Only one option is a pair of sixes, the 35 others are not a pair of sixes and would not win the game. So each roll has a 35 out of 36 chance to not be winning. Of course, just like rolls of a single die, rolls of a pair of die are independent, they do not affect each other. Hence, the probability that in 24 rolls, not a single pair of sixes comes up is 35 over 36 to the power of 24. It's just the probability of us not rolling a pair of sixes multiplied together 24 times. And this turns out to be about 0.51. Hence, again, by the law of complement, we know that the probability of winning the game must be 1 minus 0.51, or of course, 0.4. Nine. So while Demire thought he had a favorable 66% chance of winning this game, it was in fact the case that he had only a 49% chance of winning. Again, his calculations were wrong, but in this game, they strayed critically further from the truth, thinking that a rigged game was actually rigged in his favor. Sure enough, if one additional roll is added to the game, then the chances of losing fall to 49%, and thus, of course, the chances of winning become just over 50%. And similarly, for the first game, if the number of rolls in this game is reduced by one, so there are only three rolls, the chances of losing rise steeply to 58%, but Demire's math probably would have figured this is an even match. If you're just beginning to study probability, there are a few important lessons to take away from Demire's reckless gambling. Firstly, the law of complement can be super useful. Don't forget to use it. The probability of an event is 1 minus the probability of the event not occurring. And sometimes it's much more more straightforward to calculate the probability of an event not happening. Secondly, Demire was making the fatal mistake of adding probabilities. He thought, for example, that the probability of at least one six in four rolls was the probability of a six on the first roll, plus a probability of a six on the second roll, plus a probability of six on the third roll, plus a probability of six on the fourth roll. He was unknowingly trying to apply this law, that the probability of a union of events equals the sum of their probabilities. This big U means union. You can think of it as just meaning or, like roll a six on the first roll, or the second roll, or the third, or the fourth. This formula does work, but only when the events A and B are disjoint or mutually exclusive. The events of rolling sixes on different rolls are not mutually exclusive. They're not disjoint because it's possible that all four of them or three of them or two of them could occur at the same time. Because it's possible to roll a six on the first roll and the second roll, some of the probability counted here is also counted here, and thus Demire has double counted probability using this technique, and that's why he overestimated his odds of winning the game. So the simple addition rule is only going to work when the events are mutually exclusive. They can't occur 
occur simultaneously, and thus when you add their probabilities, you're not double counting anything. The last thing to take away from this comes also from the correct calculations we did, which is that if we have a sequence of independent events, like a bunch of dice rolls, then the probability of all of these events occurring is simply the product of their respective probabilities. Since the rolls of four die have nothing to do with each other, and all of them have a five in six chance of not coming up six, we can just multiply those five in six chances all by each other. This is just like flips of a coin, but is unlike drawing cards from a deck. If we flip a coin and it comes up heads, that doesn't change the fact that the next flip has a 50-50 chance of coming up tails or heads. The coin flips are independent. On the other hand, with a deck of cards, if we draw the first card and it's a 10 of hearts, well now the next card is less likely to be red and it's less likely to be a 10 because we've removed a red 10 from the deck. And the next card also has a 0% chance now of being a 10 of hearts. The successive drawing of cards from a deck are not independent events. With some basic knowledge of probability, here's a fun practice problem you could try. To encourage Andy's promising competitive Tetris career, his brother offers him a prize if he wins at least two Tetris matches in a row in a three-set series to be played with his brother and the world champion alternately. Andy can choose to have the set be brother, champion, brother, or champion, brother, champion. The champion is a better player than Andy's brother. Which series should Andy choose to maximize his chance of winning at least two Tetris matches in a row? A careful calculation to solve this problem might reveal a surprising answer. If you want to check your answer, I'll leave it in the pinned comment. This problem is, aside from narrative details, taken from this book on 50 Challenging Problems in Probability by Frederick Musteller. It's a great resource for some more fun probability practice. Let me know in the comments if you would have been a gambler in the 17th century, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep a cable cut and untucked the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm traded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet Faded, psychosomatic